Okay, so welcome to the next hour of the uh, second and last hour of generative adversarial networks you know of course um i can hope that over the break you of the 10 minute break somebody played this did somebody get this to work on on something i gave it a bit of a hard time did, did anybody get this uh gan lab to to behave sensibly um if not then i'll i'll run it on this for example on on this data and um we had it hopelessly stuck well luckily it's not for um not for credit this thing uh but this is a demo okay so let's just let's just let's just watch it run um and i think this is one of the easier examples so what you have those uh, purple lines are demonstrations of what the gradient vectors are doing to each of those points. Okay. Now keep in mind the gradients don't work on the points. The gradients work on the parameters of this manifold, which are the parameters of this generator. Okay. Of this of this network. Okay. But um, that we're showing for a given point where the gradient will take us when we are in that random point. If we were to skip that random point after we apply the gradient. Uh, this in my world kind of works, okay? This is generating samples that look kind of sensible. And if we look here on the right, um, the, well, the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which we'll speak about shortly, ends up to be at 0 0.5. This is a normalized Jensen-Shannon divergence, but, but, but this, oh, I didn't want to click on this, but this 0 0.5, which we have here, is what we want, and that shows that we can actually not do better. Okay, so the, the GAN has saturated. It's effectively reached a saddle point. Okay. And there is a question, um, what are the background colors relating to the discriminant actually signifying? No problem. So, um, so let's actually turn off, let's pause this. First of all, pause this. Okay. And let's turn off the samples, the fake and the real. And also let's just uh, turn these gradient vectors off. Okay. So what we see here is what a binary classifier looks like for um, two labels, your X and your Y. This binary classifier is a discriminator where uh, I guess green is positive, so close to one, and purple is uh, negative, close to zero or zero, okay? I guess it's white is neutral, okay? So this is a binary classifier, right? So it's, you're given a point and you classify if it's, if it's, um, if it's fake or real. Now, the training is pretty much finished here. So the discriminator, this binary classifier is now kind of useless. It's useless in face of this generator here. And this generator takes noise and the latent space here was also in two dimensions. Okay, so the noise is just this noise in two dimensions. And if you, if you pass this noise through the generator, what you get is you get these points, okay? So the background color is a binary classifier. The, these are the real points. These are the fake points. And this is what would say if, if these going now from two dimensions to 784 dimensions to digits, uh, we'd say, oh, okay, these digits look like these digits. Yeah, they kind of look like these digits. Okay, that's, that's what this is doing. And I, you might want to play with uh, Google, with TensorFlow play, Playground, which is, the same type of idea, uh, slightly more polished, but ju just this, this has huge usage, uh, just for binary classification in general. Uh, this is stuff you already know. Anyway. Okay, and <coughs> and there's a question about the data that is being roughly half from the start. I actually don't know. It shouldn't be roughly half from the start. It should be something arbitrary, random. Unless, unless we restart it is a good uh, point. So I'll, I'll skip that. 
And let's get back to the iPad. And move on. All right. Whoops. <coughs> okay. Now we love the latent space. Um, at least I do. Oh, well, people in machine learning do. So this latent space plays plays a big role, and you, you'll see you'll see some similar things when uh, you speak with Benoit in the next two days about. Uh, uh, sequence to sequence models, uh, if, if you get to that in depth and, and maybe autoencoders and things like that. But in general, the, the latent space, this space here, okay? This space here, or if you'd like in our original uh, illustration, this, this space here, even though it's just a space of noise, say that now for given noise, at least in the simplest manner, say that for some given noise, I've gotten an image. Okay, I've got an image here. But let's say I'm doing image. I've got the image two for some give, given noise. Okay. And let's then take some other noise, which is completely different. Okay, so this is, I'll, I'll call this first noise, let's call this Z1. That's like the first bit of noise. And this is a complete, this is a completely different uh, independent vector, independent IID vector from the first vector Z2. Let's say for this one, I've got the image, say that's this, this digit three, okay? We can already kind of do something uh, saying, let's now take linear interpolations between these two random noise points. And let's see what this does to this two and three, okay? And we, we can actually do much more with the latent space, but this is at least the first toy uh, thing we can do with the latent space. So just to get a feeling for this, uh, already in the original Gantt paper, this appeared, where in this case, there were actually, uh, this is one coordinate and this is another one. They both happened to two coordinates in the latent space gave you one. But then when you actually do linear interpolation between those points in the latent space, you get all these other things that actually look like images. And there seems to be a bit of a continuity. <laughs> and then, okay, this is finally the joke of February has arrived. The joke of February has arrived and the joke is, this is a very nerdy joke. Cooler if it went to 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.5, up to three. Uh -huh. And now the joke that goes above that is, it's be nice if it actually gets stuck in E. 2.7, but okay, thanks for sharing. Good. All right, so keep in mind, this does not happen with images. So if you take if you take the Im two images and you actually do linear interpolation in pixel space between the images, you're gonna get garbage. It's not gonna look like that. So this is this, uh, this love that we're giving the latent space, okay? So this latent space is kind of a feature space, okay? Now, this idea in neural networks, we didn't get to speak about it a whole lot yet. Uh, I want to go here. Um, if I just go a step back and a few days back and we go to convolutional neural networks and we look at this architecture of uh, <coughs> of um, VGG. So people have also used VGG, for example, take, I can't illustrate here on the, on this iPad, uh, but if you take this layer of 4,096 neurons, this fully connected layer that happens towards the end of VGG for images, people often treat this layer as a sensible layer in, in feature space, okay? So this feature space is a latent space, then this VGG acts like an autoencoder and it actually gives you these features, and then you might be able to do things with these features and change them a bit. So if there was a way to go back, which some people have wrongfully called deconvolution, but uh, let's just follow that phrase. If, if there was a way to do such a, a movement back, then nice things can be done. Uh, general adversarial networks take a step towards that. And you've just seen the basic general adversarial networks so far. 
Okay, so that's this kind of excitement that uh, we're doing about the latent space. Now, let's do something that's not often uh, taught in the context of this kind of general adversarial networks. And let's just, let's just play around with this idea of latent space just a bit more and go for something very, very basic, just to see, just to make a very crude analogy. Okay, so look, a generative adversarial network is an algorithm for generating things from the probability distribution of X, okay? So let's say now that we're taking almost the simplest example that one can think of, and that's an exponential density, okay? This is X and this is P of X, okay? With a mean of one, okay? You might've seen this before as lambda e to the minus lambda X. Here, lambda just equals one. One on lambda is a mean, so that's an exponential density. Okay, so let's say this is our data. This is kind of very boring data. Okay, so we, we have data points, meaning if we were to collect the data, we were to have a histogram that kind of lives under this roof. Okay, so what if you wanted a generative model for this data? Okay, and of course, one way of doing the generative model is actually to estimate this probability distribution or do kernel density estimation, but no, we want to follow the same approach and in generative adversarial networks. We just want an algorithm for that. So there are many ways to generate such exponential random variables, but one way which many of you, pretty much anybody who's probably done a course in probabilities, let alone if you've done two courses or more, is the inverse probability transform. So the idea of the inverse probability transform is simply, um, if I now look at this, uh, at this density and I, and I plot what's called the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, okay? The CDF looks like this and then goes like this. It's the integral of this density up to each point X. And it happens to be one e to the minus lam uh, lambda X, lambda this, okay? Okay, so the CDF stands for the probability of the random variable X being less than mu X, okay? All right, you obviously know this. The inverse probability transform is an idea uh, which says, okay, just for univariate random variables, also much simpler than these GANs that we're speaking about, stick a uniform random variable here, uniform zero one, then shoot it onto this axis, its distribution, yeah, stick another uniform, shoot it onto this axis, its distribution will follow the same distribution of that. So this thing more formally is look for the inverse function of the CDF, okay? The inverse function, like the quantile function, stick this uniform zero one, in the inverse function, and you'll get that this random variable is distributed like your desired distribution. It's a general recipe for generating uh, a random variable from any univariate distribution where it certainly works well when you have an analytic form for that. It doesn't, for example, for a normal distribution where you don't have a no set data. Okay, so it's not hard to see that the inverse CDF is minus uh, log uh, one minus two. You just need to take the page, in this case, the iPad and kind of flip it backwards. Yeah, I won't do that. And then that's what you see, that's what the CDF is. Okay, to see that this is the inverse function you do this. This is all side, side stories. But now just for this very crude analogy. So, so look, we have now our generative model and our generative model was just minus log u. Oops, let me write it in there, something nicer. Um, minus log u, minus log of something, okay? The model says, stick your noise, uniform zero one, it will give you an X, certainly not a face or a number, but at least it really agrees with this data here, okay? Now, if I slightly perturb, if I, if I, stick, if I stick, for example, 0 0.38 as my uniform value, and I st that's in my latent space in 0 0.37, so I've shifted by, by just, 0 0.01, then X will also shift a bit, okay? So my only story is changes in the latent space here, which are small cause small changes here. Now, when you're going to high dimensions and also taking complex combinations of things is also, you can kind of go in different directions. And do it. That's a very kind of crude background to this. Um, not sure it's of a whole lot of value, but is, this is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about generative adversarial networks. Okay, all right. So having done that, um, 
let's um, let's take a let's take a bit of a tour through uh, GAN evolution. Okay, now you got to keep in mind that we can only touch a small subset of of what there is, and I certainly, I personally don't know uh, the bulk of the all of the literature. I only know the, the kind of the main famous papers. Um, but go to this website, um, Ganzu, uh, if you'd like, and it it just it just all all these are are different papers dealing with Gans, different methods, different frameworks. Uh, Gans have gone a long way. Okay, I mean it's it's just it's just one of the big explosive things happening in deep learning. I mean keep in mind that the convolutional networks that we learned about uh, a few days ago. And then the say tricks of the trade that we learned about with Benoit, you know, these things have been around for a while, but GANs are kind of uh, 2014 onwards. So our, our tour of our tour of GANs, we're just going to speak about the, the, the big things and, and big ideas and only a subset of them. So one thing that came kind of immediately almost after the original GAN paper is this thing called conditional GAN. If you remember when when I started giving you this spiel about uh, generative models, uh, I didn't want you to get confused between the X and the X and the Y. But in generative models, you know, you can speak about X or X Y. You know, you can have your labels or you cannot have the labels. Okay. Uh, and the original GAN thing, which we saw, made no use of the Y. We didn't care if the digit that we fed into. So these digits that we fed into the GAN were not labeled in any way. We didn't make use of the fact there's a label zero or uh, one or nine or knowing that this is a frog or whatever it is, et cetera, okay? The idea of conditional GAN is to make use of that. And this is how it works. So our discriminator is now not just going to be a function of X, it's going to be a function of x and y. This, this is this is not a conditional probability. This is just a, a signifying the discriminator a function of x and y. And the generator is not only going to be a function of the latent space uh, variable z. It's also going to be a function of the latent. Y. So it's the addition of this y term. Okay. Here's an image from the conditional GAN paper. So the discriminator, you give it an x and you give it a y and it tells you does this thing conditional on this thing being a y is it still it gives you a probability something in the range zero one okay what's the chance of it being fake or real okay and the generator you also feed in the labels in the same way you feed in the labels into the generator, okay? And the generator then knows to generate things from different labels, okay? So then you get this picture, for example. That's a picture from this original conditional GAN paper. And now many, now every time there's like an idea, this idea of conditional GAN, then the GAN works that follow often use that idea. That's just a very natural and basic idea. It might've been alluded to already in the original. Okay, so this was asking to generate digit zero, asking to generate digit one, asking to generate digit two, up to asking to generate digit nine, etc. And these are all randomly generated digits. Okay, at the time, this conditional GAN is still with a multi layer first spectrum, no convolution, just fully dense, quite a lot of parameters, uh, and not making any use of the spatial uh, fact that these are images. What can this be used for? What can conditional GAN be used for? Look, we've got all this data. What can we do with all this data? Ah, wonderful. So there's a, from the creator of, of the February joke, uh, data augmentation, data augmentation. Okay, so look, you've got data. You can now even train on this data and you know the labels, zero, one, two, up to nine. Okay, so, you know, data augmentation, uh, you spoke with Benoit about some methods of data augmentation. GAN is a very sophisticated method of data augmentation. 
direction, right? I mean, with images, you can rotate the images, you can do other things, but with GANs, you can actually, you know, you can create a whole bunch of other things. Of course, this is not the best data, but that's always a price you pay with data augmentation. Uh, it can also be used for semi-supervised learning. So in cases where we have quite a lot of data, but some of the data is uh, unlabeled, then, uh, oh, sorry, well, that's it. The GANs in general can be used for that, but not conditional GAN per se. Then GANs can be used for semi-supervised. Okay. Afterward, let's speak about convolutional again. So this took about two years uh, from 2014, et cetera, uh, to get this uh, convolutional again. Um, no surprises in this story. So now our generator is a convolutional network. And look, look, at, look at the generator. The generator takes variables from the latent space. Okay, So you can get the paper here. And that's, of course, all these papers are papers you can work on for your project, et cetera. Um, okay, so it is latent space and it's actually creating an image and we don't have dense layers like before. We have here quite a lot of channels and less channels and less channels and less channels and we've got convolutions, etc. with stride two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you get your fake image. Okay, so that's convolutional again. And the, the discriminator, was also a convolutional network that goes the other way, it takes an image and classifies fake or real. Okay. <coughs> so at the time, these were the most impressive pictures that one could see. These are these are these are fake bedrooms, uh, kind of like IKEA, also fake bedrooms. Um, also, but yeah, okay, maybe not. Okay, so that's that's that. These are all fake bedrooms. Um, it created that thing. But this was uh, also a lot of excitement, uh, uh, kind of terrifying. So wait, so I, I see terrifying. So, so the fake faces didn't, didn't terrify you, but the fake bedrooms did. Fair enough. I mean, I personally care more for the faces, but okay, fair enough. All right, uh, all, of it, all of it is terrifying, I agree. So having said that, there's a statement, all of it is terrifying. I think it's our responsibility not to keep this as an end statement. Uh, I'll actually send you to the end because we might we might not get to it because we don't have enough time. Um, there's this video by Vox, uh, which we put in the end. And um, it's it's actually a horrible video. I mean, the um, th this is the at the bottom, they are more resilient to vanishing gra gradients. It's not a joke. This is just uh, some bug with uh, our typesetting system. Uh, but this video uh, is actually uh, about deep fakes and not deep fakes that are just in the political sense, but also in the, in the sexual and abusive sense. So yes, GANs are terrifying, uh, but it's kind of a, a, a ship that has kind of sailed. So as, as machine learners and, and scientists and mathematicians, I think we just need to learn what's happening to also better defend against it. Uh, but yeah, we do need to be aware that this is, this is a major uh, problem, uh, but it's, it, it, it's probably something that cannot be stopped. Um, so back to back to business. Um, taken from the 2016 GAN paper, um, we see now the excitement of the latent space um, uh, going one step further. In this case, you've got a uh, let me go let me go back here. You've got a, a smiling. Um, man uh, and uh, you subtract from it um, so a smiling woman minus a neutral woman plus a neutral man gives you a smiling man okay so you've you've removed the woman from the woman you've added the man you've got a man so the the, the what's happening in the latent space is 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 quite incredible so the the Features in latent space, even though they're random, they, they're actually the, the way our generative model is learning how to map those latent features into images, each one of those features has some meaning. And it's not that a feature per se have meaning. It's, it's like genes, you know, it's not like the specific gene that you know that that feature, you know, the 70 second variable is not what makes it a man, but within this hundred dimensional feature space, you could speak geometrically about gender, for example. Uh, or you can take a man with glasses 
remove from it a man without glasses and add a woman and you get a woman with glasses. I mean, this is shocking, shocking, uh, at least to me, uh, probably to you too. Um, there's, there's a comment, using convolutions makes sense with CNNs because your images are spatial invariants, but why does that help with the random noise input you're generating? Why convolutional GANs? So, um, be, because, because still we're speaking about images, okay? So again, the whole motivation of, of convolutional neural networks in general, right, is to, uh, to use spatial invariants and to reduce the number of parameters. Uh, these are these are two di different things, right? Now here you can you can have a model with a whole lot of neurons, but not so many parameters. Okay, and uh, you're you're building up. If if these were you just take you go back and you think about the just just kind of flip it on its head. If you go to the convolutional neural networks, all right, jumping down to the image of uh, um, of VGG, okay? From VGG, we took an image on the left and we got features on the right. And don't think about the specific label. That's uh, think of these 4,096 neurons as features that actually captured quite a lot of complicated things. Now we are, we're going backwards. Uh, that's the only explanation I have. Um, okay. So that's nice, uh, GANs with convolutions, uh, expected, et cetera. The, the next step is, uh, is actually making something that looks uh, real. Uh, and it took a while, uh, but yeah, these things don't exist. Okay. Uh, the butterfly, the landform, the dog, they all don't exist. And this is from this paper. You can look at the paper. It's a big paper, large scale GANs. Um, I'm not giving much insight into this paper because we beyond the, with the exception of showing you these images. So this was now trained on ImageNet, okay? Not the toy data sets we've played with, say Flight 10 or MNIST, et cetera, but actually ImageNet and, and ImageNet has, you know, uh, 15 gigabytes of, of uh, rich image, no, sorry, 150 gigabytes of rich image data uh, with a thousand labels, etc. Now, just to know that if you look at this paper, and I do recommend it, then you'll see actually that it has used a few steps in the way, such as uh, regularization using singular value decompositions in each layer and all kinds of other advances. But actually, what we see in GANs is that mathematics is, and we're in a course in mathematical engineering and deep learning, this, this paper is both an engineering feat because it has a lot of GPUs and it's trained correctly, et cetera, and the right clusters and, and planning it all, but it also makes use of, of a few other papers on the way, uh, which had a lot of uh, mathematical insights. Everybody likes to look at this picture uh, generated by GAN. <coughs> okay. Um, this thing doesn't exist, but uh, one, one, one description, well, it, it's not something that we have in humanity. It's like a tennis ball slash dog. Uh, ImageNet has about a hundred dog classes and only one tennis ball class. So one image is kind of, one class is, is um, littered in other class in a sense. So the convolutional GAN that was trained was, was, was uh, then, you know, it, it, that's what it knows. I know how to make an eyes and a nose. Okay, and now we come to style GAN, which is, uh, there was a comment in the chat, terrifying. To me, I found that's the, the, the most terrifying. Um, simply, I'll, I'll just move back to that, this video. If you haven't seen, not uh, the dog's not terrifying. If you haven't seen this video at the top of the unit, uh, it's kind of a video that accompanies the paper. It's a paper by uh, brilliant researchers in NVIDIA. If you haven't seen this video, you must see it. Uh, all these uh, impressive looking people that are not real and a whole bunch of games with the latent space. So um, real, real, not real. Not real, but also kind of playing with the combination of this 
from this to create this with uh, a whole bunch of parameterizations and basically then shrinking the latent space down. So we won't speak in detail uh, on this architecture, but the architecture already does something with the, with the latent space. So on the left here, we have a traditional architecture, traditional, I mean, traditional is, this field moves very fast. Traditional is 2016 and the paper is 2018. Okay, traditional. Uh, where we've got the latent variables and you stick them in a convolutional uh, network. But here what they do is they take the, the latent variables and they actually already train the latent variables through a sequence of fully, fully connected uh, layers. And then they have these kind of mushed up latent variables. And then they actually feed them into multiple um, uh, spots. But be careful with what I'm saying here. So here I'm calling the latent variables. They're actually going to be levers that you choose where the noise is actual noise. Okay, so, so you've got kind of two types of, before I, I mix the latent and the noise, okay? So the Z here is, is our kind of variables that you, you choose to tweak different properties. Uh, so a whole, a whole lot of very impressive things happening with this paper. I thought 2018, maybe 2019, depends. Uh, you know, there's time for papers. Okay, questions, thoughts? All right, let's move on. So <clears throat> a few more GAN details. Um, so let's dive into a few more mathematical details. And for this, we need to review a few things. So the kullback liver divergence um, is a measure of distance, although it's not a metric because it's not symmetric, between two probability distributions. Okay, we've got the say the probability distribution P and the probability distribution Q. Okay, think of them as densities or probability mass functions, but just think of them as densities. So the uh, Kullback Leiber divergence is uh, the expected value of this uh, log likelihood ratio with respect to the probability uh, distribution of the numerator. Okay, that's what it is. I mean, this x here, this can be an integral, 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 because this x is, is high dimensional, right? On all, all, the, all the features, so all the pixels, if you think. Okay, so that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, the, a related, and, and you know, you've used this before for different things, et cetera, but it's, we're gonna use it now to just define something called the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Okay, which is not treating um, P and Q in an, in an asymmetric manner. So ju just to be clear, DKLPO, oh, I don't need to write this, this. okay? DKLPQ is not equal to DKLQP because we're changing the rows, okay? It's just, this is just not a symmetric expression, okay? In the Jensen-Shannon divergence, you take P and you take Q, and then you create this thing, R. Now, P and Q are not numbers. It's P of X plus Q of X divided by two equals R of X. So this is a mixture distribution of the two distributions, right? So if you do a convex combination like that, in this case, a half and half of each distribution, you get the mixture distribution. So that's your R, okay? And what you're doing is then the uh, kubrick liber distance from P to the middle and R to the middle, from P to R and Q to R, and you're taking the average. Okay, that's one of these halves. So that's called the jensen salmon uh, divergence, and it's symmetric, and it can be shown to be bounded, okay, between zero and log two. If you were working here with log base two, they just live in the interval zero, one, as some people do in information theory, but that one will one plus, okay. These are the names for it. Uh, and just so you know, you can actually use this to make a proper metric. Okay, so a metric in the space of distribution, you do it by taking the square root. <coughs> now, going back to the original GAN, vanilla GAN, and the original GAN is all, all these, we didn't, we didn't speak about the details, but all of these, we changed the model. We made the model richer, but you know, some of, most of them use this, this original GAN. Uh, some, the vanilla GAN, which actually has this, this kind of general algorithm. Okay, now, whoops, the, the vanilla GAN. 
slide here. Okay, that's our vanilla again. So going back to the vanilla GAN formulation, uh, our claim here, which appeared in the original 2014 paper already, is that GANs minimize the Jensen channel divergence. Okay, now all these dis all these types of distances between distributions are here. Uh, keep in mind that if they, in general, even though, for example, cool group library, even though it's not a metric, okay, if P equals to Q, what's the uh, cool group library uh, divergence if you have the same density? What's a cool group library density if P equals to Q? Zero, okay? And in general, up to some issues, and these issues are gonna matter soon, you, you have typical forms of continuity. So if P is continuity in probability distribution, so, so if P is getting closer and closer to Q, the, dens the, the kulberg Liver distance is getting closer and closer. Similar with the Jensen channel. It'll turn out that this continuity doesn't work well if the distributions don't overlap on the same support. And that's what we're gonna come up with Wasserstein Jensen. But, but let's build up to that. Okay, so, E, e, the, this is the original derivation in a sense. So vanilla GAN minimizes the Jensen Shannon divergence. Okay, let, let's see this. Uh, so, or outline the key point. So for a fixed generator, uh, there is a claim. So if I fix the generator, there's a claim that the optimal discriminator is actually going to be this, okay? And yeah, PGX here is now the distribution of the samples generated by this generator, okay? And to see this is actually not so hard. So what you need to do is you need to look at the value function. So the value function is integral on all of the data samples X with respect to the probability distribution function of the data. That was this expectation of the log of D of X. And this is integral with respect to the probability distribution of the sample of the noise, okay? That was the second expectation. These were the two terms of the vanilla gang. We had, uh, you, could, you could go from this to this. You've got this guy. So now you've got an integrand with respect to x. Um, but if you consider this function in the integrand, this function is this guy, as a, as a function of y, where your y is, um, is d of x, okay? Your y is d of x. Again, yeah, look at this transition. We went from d g of x to d of x, d g of z, sorry, to d of x, okay? And then this is what we'll call, we'll call this guy our y. This is our y and this is our y. So you can just take the derivative of this function, see that it's unimodal and see that it's maximized at this point. And then this thing plays the role of a and this thing plays the role of b. So if the integrand is uh, maximized at this point, then you could say that this integral here is uh, bounded by this thing. So the point is that we've stuck here the optimal discriminator, okay? This is not something op oh, sorry, optimal discriminator like The optimal discriminator is not something that you're gonna compute algorithmically because these distributions are only there to help us analyze things. We can't work with them. They're high dimensional distributions we can't work with. By the way, in related fields, uh, if somebody's heard of, of, uh, of uh, variational autoencoders, for example, uh, many fields that are happening now in, supervised, in unsupervised learning, people do work with these distributions or approximations. Of them. But in GANs, we don't work with the distributions, okay? so. We write this distribution here, and this would be the optimal D for any given G, uh, but we can't, it's not something we're computing. And then let's call this C of G, okay? Now you can actually say, observe this, uh, do at home. Okay, let me suggest that you do this thing at home. Observe that C of G, that you could represent this thing that we wrote here. This is now too quick if you've no, never seen this before as minus log four. Yeah, that's minus two log two if you'd like. 
twice the uh, jensen sanin diversion between the divergence between the data and the gene. Okay, so the cost, you know, the, when go, go with this definition of the jensen sanin divergence and see that this holds. Okay, so the cost for fixed G is this guy. Now, this is for any G, we see what the discriminator does. This is going to be like the discriminator is optimal for a given G. What the general wants to do, it wants to pull this thing down, remember? Because our, our minimax formulation was min G max D of this guy, which was uh, effectively this guy. Okay, that was our minimax formulation. And it can be shown, and the details are here, they're not complicated actually, but you don't have to look at that at home per se, that uh, that's achieved when PG equals P data. Now, if PG equals P data, you can, you can, you can compute this exactly, okay? Then um, the Jensen-Shannon divergence, when PG equals P data, then R is just P, and that's equal to a Cliver distance, so it's actually zero. So actually your cost is minus two log two is it's minus 1.3860, okay? So this is just some somewhat theoretical footing for the fact that when the probability distribution of the generator equals the probability distribution of the data, then it's a saddle point in this minimax formulation in the sense that you know what the discriminator is going to do. The discriminator is going to get this. You know what the generator is going to do. The generator is going to uh, do this, okay? And you actually know that d star of x, in this case, is going to be a half because these two guys are equal. Okay, so, and the discriminator is going to be useless, really. Okay, so, there's more details of that on the GAN paper, but this specific argument here is actually not so complicated and it's kind of at the, at the heart of the, of the basic vanilla GAN. Uh, so I recommend looking at it. All right. Um, now, if we move forward, and there's been actually a lot of moving forward in the last couple of years, then the whole loss or objective function formulations that we spoke about, uh, there have been many, 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 many different versions of these objective functions, okay? Uh, so I'm not talking about different architectures for the generator network or the discriminator network. I'm talking about different objective functions, different formulations of VDG, okay? And look, for example, if you'd like on this paper, where you'll find this table and you'll see that <clears throat> you know, there's, there's just a whole bunch of variants. And in some of these variants, the discriminator is no longer a zero one function. It's no longer really a discriminator. It's some other quality measure. It's sometimes it just gives you something in the whole real line. Okay. So of course we don't have time to speak about all of that, uh, but I did want to focus a bit on this, on this exciting thing called the washer thing. Uh, but I think we probably won't have a whole bunch of time. So just, just give a bit of motivation. Um, so this is one of the papers on the reading list potentially for the project, et cetera. And it's also just an indication of the fact that even though generative adversarial networks kind of really requires a lot of empirical and things like that and kind of empirical testing, there's actually been a whole lot of mathematics associated with, with it too. Okay, so let me, let me just uh, motivate the use of, of, of a different, so now what I wanna do is I wanna go back to, to the original GAN formulation. I wanna say, okay, well, since then humanity's improved, let's take the original GAN formulation, the vanilla GAN. Yeah, this still holds, you've got a generator and discriminator, but this um, objective here, which is the vanilla GAN, okay, uh, is now going to be replaced. Again, this is different than replacing the architecture of D and G, okay? It's, it, it's, in, it's in a sense kind of orthogonal or, or, or independent than replacement of or enhancement of the architecture of D and G. It's dealing with the objective function. And if, if this is done well, then a whole lot of good things can happen. Okay, 
Now, here's a, uh, what we did here is we butchered. What I did here is I took um, things from this uh, 2017 Wasserstein Gantt paper and actually just uh, brutally pasted a few things. We won't have time to speak about them all, but I'll actually explain briefly. And we'll need to almost finish with that. Um, <coughs> okay. So a key problem with uh, minimization of the minimization of the Jensen Shannon divergence, which we argued now that that's what vanilla GAN does. So a key problem with minimization of this guy, okay, of the Jensen Shannon divergence. A key problem with that is if your distributions don't have overlapping support or have very little overlapping support, the gradient won't move. In fact, if there's no overlapping support, so if you take, you can, uh, I'll write another thing, try at home, okay? Try at home. So this is, these are computable expressions for simple things. So take, take a distribution like this, call this P, this is now univariate, okay? And take a distribution like that, Q. Okay, these two distributions. I don't know, two shifted beta distributions or whatever, just two distributions with, with, overlapping, with no overlapping support. What you'll see is that their jensen sarin divergence is just constant. And when one, yeah, so that's a thing to do. Try to, try to do this and compute, compute the jensen sarin divergence when the distributions don't have overlapping support. Okay, so you'll need to see what the, mixture distribution of the two is, what it looks like, the average of these two, et cetera, and compute it. And you'll see that the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is up to a constant, the value of the GAN game, okay? It's what, where GAN puts us, doesn't move, stuck, okay? Now, why would distributions have non-overlapping support? Well, when you're speaking about high dimensional images, it might be that in high dimensional space, and by, by the way, by the support of the distribution, if it's not clear, the support of the distribution is a set in the domain where you get kind of positive density or positive probability mass, okay? So in high dimensional images, you might have that things are very far from each other, okay? So you these cases of non-overlapping support presumably happen. We don't really have, we don't have, know this for sure, but, but that's what kind of experience kind of hints at. Okay, so when you're using the Jensen-Shannon divergence, you have no uh, mechanism in the gradient descent to nudge the probability distribution of say PG, right? Because this is the thing you're moving towards P data, okay? Because the story of GAN is you want to nudge as you're training PG towards P data. Now, the story of, of the Wasserstein metric is that it does do that. It does do this. And here, there's this is bits from this paper. You can have a look. It, it, it's, it's a slightly more formal paper. It speaks about a few different matrix, uh, well, a few different, let's call them uh, very crudely, measures of distance between distributions little variation of called the Kleiber of the Jensen Shannon diversions. And finally, the earth mover, which is called Wasserstein one as well. Okay. So this is, this is a kind of a more complicated metric. And then it relates it to a, you can actually using um, something called the Contra Robert Rubinstein duality, you can actually represent it as follows. Okay. So the Wasserstein metric is, this is a metric. This is not an optimization. Well, it's an optimization problem. It's a supremum over all functions f, but it's also a metric. It's one of those metrics that, you know, it's not just perspective, compute this. It says in this case, look at all the functions f on the domain that we're looking at that are one Lipschitz, okay? So this norm is with respect to the uh, space that we're looking at. So it can just be the Euclidean norm. And, and we, 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 want, we want the function slope. This is one Lipschitz, okay? Or if you had a k here, it would be k Lipschitz, okay? So, this is a completely different metric between two probability distributions, which, you know, just like that might seem a bit obscure. There are motivating reasons in this paper here, Wasserstein GAN, but there, of course, are known to probabilists earlier in general that say why to use 
this as your loss instead of Jensen Chairman. I'll finish in a minute or two. I see you over time. I'll finish in just a few minutes, five minutes. Okay, so why use Wasserstein distance instead of Jensen Chairman? And the reason is that even when there's no overlapping support, then if we are doing gradient ba based on optimization um, on uh, with the Wasserstein metric, the distributions will still move. Now, the nice thing about this paper, if you, if you choose to look at it, is it does these things and describes a few of these theoretical properties of metric, but then it actually gives you the WGAN algorithm. So I'll finish pretty much with the WGAN algorithm on this section, just pick a few, few things on, 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 on another section and finish. Okay, so the, the key idea is, well, how are we gonna compute this metric? Well, let's now treat F, this unknown F, which is this thing we're looking for in the superhum, let's make that our discriminator. So the discriminator is no longer this thing that's discriminating. It's actually some measure of distance between the distributions. Okay, it has a different kind of physical probabilistic meaning. The discriminator is not gonna be a Boolean classifier, something that gives us something in an probability in an interval zero one. It's going to be a function that's one Lipschitz or K Lipschitz and so on. And then the WGAN objective becomes this thing. Okay, so this looks similarly to what we had before. It says, here's your generator, optimize that after the discriminator is done her or his bit uh, thing. Okay, there's only this constraint, the discriminator needs to be within some set of functions. Um, so when you look at this function, at the, at the algorithm, this is the claim, the discriminator's uh, Lipschitz, constant is less than one. So you can actually trim the discriminator. Now, the, the subtle difference in this algorithm, that's very different than the original GAN algorithm. In this algorithm, if you have the compute power, you can train the discriminator up to exhaustion. So you, you, it's not a problem to train the discriminator up to exhaustion because it just means that you're getting kind of a, a better measure for the Wasserstein GAN as you get better and better. So, from a practical perspective, you can run it for like n steps and n can be five, 10 or 100. And if you have the compute power, you can do it. And then for that uh, discriminator, you do here, the general. Okay, so that's pretty much all the time uh, we had to speak about Wasserstein again, just some things we're not covering just so you're aware of. Uh, so there's a bit here on quality measures. Uh, it's not clear how to evaluate again. Even the battery of the iPad is low, we are finishing. So it's not clear how to evaluate GANs, right? Because I mean, when you're looking at classification or regression, certainly classification, it's clear how to evaluate precision, recall, F1, blah, 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 accuracy. How do you evaluate GANs? So there've been techniques, the inception score was the, the first one, which basically uses an inception neural network and then sees the distribution of the labels if it makes sense. So you actually use a neural network on the GAN. And this was the second method. And finally, uh, if you think of applications, well, we've seen some applications and we spoke here, I'll go, I'll go we, we spoke about a, uh, the horrible negative applications that are also happening, which we should avoid. Uh, but if you uh, take time and watch this kind of keynote presentation by Ian Goodfellow, the father of GANs, a few years after GANs were created, you'll see some of these applications above and there are many and numerous. And that's all we have time for. Um, are there any questions? I think I spoke a lot. No questions. Okay, so tomorrow um, you guys have the pleasure of meeting Benoit. Now, I promise in tomorrow's lecture, and I very much appreciate the fact that Benoit didn't go into this lecture and hit the end meeting. Uh, I promise not to do that uh, tomorrow. So um, that's tomorrow. Oh, you also have a homework due tomorrow. Um, good luck. Work hard and send questions if you have.
Okay, bye everybody. Thanks, Johnny. Oh, ben oh Benoit, well, uh, and they will probably find your slides online uh, tomorrow morning, I assume, or something. Yes, like that. yes. Okay, very good. And uh, no end meeting. See you. See you, Uni. Very good. Bye-bye.